Hi, good morning everyone. So welcome to our 11 o'clock um, webinar. So today we'll be having SGX updates as well as first rate update, followed by macro and sector outlook for the banking sector in Singapore, Singapore weekly, US weekly, and our technical outlook. So we'll start off with the Singapore Banking Monthly. So for this particular uh, month in August, 60s uh, growth finally uh, reached its peak and fell. So now I'll talk about the loans first. So for the month of August, overall loans growth in Singapore was rather sluggish at 2.2% year on year. And this was mainly still due to the consumer loans which contracted for the fifth consecutive month, uh, which is dragged by a persistent weakness in housing loans contraction of about 1.1%. So if you can look at the red line here, that's your domestic consumer loans. It's been contracting for the past five months and it's in below the 0% mark. And it's mainly up, held, up, held up by business loans. Uh, which is uh, mainly due to your building and construction loan so far. And the other part of the banking money is our CASA. So your current and savings account, one thing that's interesting is that it bounced back up from the contraction and recover in August, while our fixed Z, which is the red line here, um, slowed slightly after peaking at 23% in uh, July. So in August, it fell slightly to 185 so despite the recent Fed rate cut that we saw in July and some minor downward adjustments of FD rates in September, we saw that the fixed deposits are still growing rather strongly. And one of the reasons why could be due to the saturation of appetite for Singapore savings bonds. So SSV right now is around 1.68%, while the banks are still giving rather attractive interest rates of 1.5 to 2%. So naturally, investors will still put their money into fixed deposits. So um, the tight liquidity in the banking system right now also sustain competition for deposits. So it's rather difficult for the banks to lower the fixed D rates too much in the near term. So moving on to interest rates, three months cyber is a uh, flat month on month. It's rather unchanged, while three months saw dip three basis points to 1.69%. So interest rate cuts uh, from the US side limits the upside for the interest margin expansion for the second half of 2019, which is reiterated uh, for the past few months. And the interest margin will be softer in third quarter and fourth quarter. So uh, one of the bright spots of this is that this, the banks are releasing the excess fixed deposits. So fixed deposits are rather pricey. So with lesser fixed Ds in the uh, funding mix, there will also be lower cost of funding to offset some of the impact of lower interest rates on the top line of net interest margins. So overall, we expect banks to de deliver full year uh, net interest margin improvement uh, due to the performance in the first half and also due to the lag effect of loan repricing in the second half. So moving on to some updates on SGX. So we usually look at the VIX index uh, to look at volatility uh, in the global markets. So we saw that in August and May where Trump uh, introduced tariff hikes uh, on 1st August and 5th May, that's, those two events created the two most volatile months for global stocks based on the VIX index. So correspondingly, our SGX der derivative daily average volume, which is your DDAV, spiked 54% and 33% in May and August. So this supports our case that uh, SGX business, especially the derivatives volume business, will benefit when there's higher volatility in the markets. And some updates on Hong Kong side, loans grow subdued at 5%. And the low, Hong Kong's loan demand remains cautious due to high interest rates and lingering trade tensions. So three months cybers fell seven bips to 2.263. So overall, we maintain the Singapore banking sector at overweight because, overweight because we believe that the banks, um, the fundamentals are still healthy and still strong and it remains intact to withstand risk and still deliver growth uh, in the next few months, uh, next few quarters. So, Operating environment remains stable despite slowing regional growth. The asset quality remains benign. NPR ratio for all three banks at 1.5%. And increasing diversification should offset uh, some of the downward pressure on your net interest income. And also better cost management and low provision should provide their uplift to ROEs. So the banking sector also pro provides very attractive uh, dividend yield support of around 5%, which is one of the highest in the region. And downside risk to net interest margin to be slightly offset by better deposits mix as they release excess fixed D and this will in turn bring down the cost of funding and maybe soften the pressure on the net interest margin due to falling interest rates. So that's it for Singapore Banking Monthly. I'll move on to Singapore Exchange. So recently I released an update report on SGX and one of the main themes of my report is that there's still structural growth in derivatives in Asia. So there's a rising popularity of derivatives 
uh, which is a trend we observe in emerging markets in the Asia Pacific region and not just in Singapore. So when you look at figure one, you see that the red line is SGX DD uh, derivatives volume growth. And as compared to our APEC region growth and global growth, it's uh, quite well supported by demand in the emerging markets region. So our opinion is that the growth of derivatives will be sustained by increasing interconnectedness, uh, globalization of markets and institutions that require risk management and hedging tools due to the first two points. And also from the figure two, you can see that APEC derivative volume growth versus market cap growth in the APEC region. It, it uh, really corresponds to the growth of the market caps in these uh, emerging markets. And from figure three as compared to figure four, so figure three is a uh, a chart based on derivative volume growth in Asia, the entire of Asia. So the CAGR of the growth of derivative volume is around 23%. And for the same period, SGX grew at 13%. Uh, so you can see that growth in, the, uh, in Asia will support future growth of uh, SGX efforts to continuously uh, diversify and increase derivative uh, offerings. And uh, second point in my report is that uh, derivatives still remains the main contributor to SGX revenue and will continue to do so. And revenue contribution, contribution from derivative grew from 30% in 2014 to 51% in 2019, while total revenue grew uh, only 32%. So revenue actually tripled in the last decade. And if we were to look 10 years ago, securities is the one that dominated SGX revenues and accounted for 40%. Whereas if you look at now FY19, it is your derivatives volume uh, revenue that dominates your earnings at 51%. So the third thing is um, the FTSE China A50 index futures remains the main driver of SGX volumes for derivatives. So from the chart here, you can see that the top four, which is your MSCI Taiwan index futures, Nifty 50, Nikkei 225 and FTSE China A50 index futures. FTSE China is the one that um, leads by a far margin uh, as compared to the top four equity index futures. So 44% of it comes from China A50. So with Hong Kong exchange, uh, with the potential of them introducing their own China A share products, XGX is vulnerable in the face of competition. So this is uh, an advantage and disadvantage chart. I will just go through it briefly. If you want to know more, you can refer to my report. So the advantage of um, uh, on SGX side, when Hong Kong were to introduce China A50, is that the Hong Kong's product of MSCI A index is subject to changes over time, which could create uncertainty and risk for investors. And with Hong Kong joining in uh, with their own products, there's a larger ecosystem as well. And for SGX side, they have always been offering margin offsets across correlated products such as FX, iron ore, and equity derivatives. So this will create margin uh, cross-marketing efficiencies for investors who choose SGX. And SGX also have a much longer history and deeper liquidity as the first mover. However, um, definitely if Hong Kong were to join in as competition, uh, people, uh, investors in China will definitely prefer Hong Kong exchange due to a close proximity. And the MSCI China uh, A index that Hong Kong exchange is going to offer is much more representative of the Asia market. And also, uh, SGX has to be prepared that Hong Kong will have aggressive rebates during the initial ramp up period as they try to uh, increase liquidity and uh, increase their volumes. So our view is that while we will keep an eye out on this new MSCI product from Hong Kong, um, the threat and the launch is not yet confirmed. And political considerations wise, that might add another layer of uncertainty to how fast this could be approved. So we are not too concerned on Hong Kong's exchange move to launch uh, the China A products at the moment, uh, with SGX still having the upper hand as the first mover and continuous diversification. So with diversification in derivatives, uh, FX futures and iron ore, uh, if we were to look at FY19, they contributed to 17 and 5% in FY19. And as compared to 2014, it's virtually non-existent contribution from FX futures and iron ore. So moving forward, top line growth will largely depend on how SGX continuously diversify its derivative products offerings. So we maintain accumulate at a higher target price of $8.60, previously $8.07. So the higher target price is mainly due to upward adjustments of our FY20 to 21 DDAV forecast by 2% and 4%. And we are positive that XGX diversified suite of products will sustain growth in 2020 and beyond. And some of the structural tailwinds that XGX is benefiting from includes increased global flows into Asian equities, currency transactions, 
and also a broader range of commodity futures product demand. So that's it for me. I'll pass on to Natalie for first read. Hi, okay, so to, uh, today I'll be talking about the site visit that we uh, I went for uh, for first read um, in Jakarta, where, where I visited uh, three of um, first reads. Um, hi, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, so last week uh, I visited um, some of first reads assets in Jakarta, and they are healthcare. They are healthcare read. So uh, during the visit, I visited three of the hospitals as well as one of the hotel country club assets. So a little bit of background of uh, First Read. First Read, uh, um, in the last 12 months, their share price has fallen about 10%. This is due to the down, downgrading of the credit rating of their sponsor, um, Lipo Karachi. And because 100% of their First Read's assets are actually on master lease, um, with 82% of the leases actually made out to Lipo Karachi, First Read was affected um, due to the credit down rating as well. So one of the major overhangs for the share price, um, it remains the renewal of the master leases with Lipo Karachi. And um, from, from figure one, you can see that um, the nearest, uh, soonest lease expiry is actually in August 20, uh, 2021. Um, the assets that we visited are Lipo uh, Salam, Salam Hospitals, Lipo Village, uh, Kebunju, and as well as the uh, Cancer Center. And so three of these assets actually have a December 2021 um, lease expiry, which is the second earliest in the portfolio. And these um, these assets, um, these three hospital assets actually uh, contribute 23% of FY18 revenue. So uh, one thing that we noted during um, the site visit is that um, the portfolio is underpinned by tertiary care um, hospitals. And tertiary care hospitals are basically a highly specialized uh, consultative care um, hospitals, and they handle more complex uh, complex specialized uh, cases. So some of these hospitals uh, actually have uh, specialized in selected branches of medicine, such as neuroscience, cardiology, and oncology. And being tertiary care hospitals, they actually have a better, uh, rev higher revenue intensity per patient, as well as margins. Some of the resident and practicing doctors are the nation's best in their respective fields. And so this also helps to draw um, some of the patients to these hospitals. Operationally, um, the occupancy is healthy in the 85% range. Um, and for all the assets that are leased out to Lipo Karawachi, the rent to EBITDA ratio, uh, which is like a cover, a uh, rent to EBITDA cover, is uh, in the 65% range for FY18. Yeah. And so for the two assets that the, are having the second earliest lease renewals, which is Lipo Village and Kebun Jurok, it, they, are, they are mature hospitals. Um, that means that they have been in operation for uh, longer than 15 years. Uh, it's actually, for Lipo Village, it's actually a 24-year-old asset, and for Kebun Jurok, it's a 28-year-old asset. So these are mature, uh, mature hospitals, um, and their rent to EBITDA ratio is significantly lower than 56%. And this is good. The lower the ratio, the better it is. Uh, meaning to say that rent takes up a smaller portion of uh, the EBITDA. Uh, in terms of the dividend yield and the price to NAV, we know that actually it's uh, for the dividend yield is actually in the it's relatively high, around the eight 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 percent, and it's at a plus one standard deviation rate uh, level. Uh, for the for the price to NAV is at a negative one uh, standard deviation level. So um, this, these are some of the pictures from our site visit. And moving on to Edmund for US Weekly. Hi, thank you, Natalie. So moving on to the US Weekly. So for the sector performance last week, you can see that uh, most of the sectors are down. And uh, this is mainly because the ISN manufacturing index was uh, at 10-year lows. And that resulted in a renewed fear of a recession going forward. But uh, the, according to the Friday US job data, it seems that the US economy is slowing rather than collapsing. So we think that uh, currently a recession is, uh, is still not uh, reaching sight yet. So moving forward, uh, this is a, most of the banks will be releasing their earnings results for 3Q on the 15th of October. Next, uh, I will go through uh, Sienna. So Sienna is a component vendor for telcos and uh, cloud service providers. So they mainly make uh, networking components. So we see two key drivers for Sienna's growth. The first is uh, a strong showing from the cloud service providers. 
And next, we expect a ramp up from the networking spending of uh, service providers such as AT&T and Verizon. So we have a technical buy rating for Siena because uh, we think that the multiple currently is rather attractive given its re revenue growth opportunity from cloud service providers and uh, telco. And also, uh, we think that you, there is some, uh, because there's a higher percentage of software and service contribution to revenue, it will mitigate the cyclicality of the sector to changes in the KPAT spending from uh, its customers. So the first point is the strength from the cloud service providers. Um, in 3FQ19, Siena marked an impressive 48% year-on-year growth. And uh, they mentioned that one of the largest customers was a cloud service provider with uh, three out of its 10 top customers being web scale as well. Moving forward, Siena is going to launch the 800G product uh, mainly at the end of this year, which will likely consolidate its competitive advantage and accelerate its share gains. The second point is the ramp up from the networking spending for the telcos. So Siena has secured two of the largest uh, service providers, AT&T and Verizon, and this has led their revenue to increase by 13% year on year in 3FQ. So the management has expressed confidence in revenue growth from the telco giants, mainly because they are still fixated in uh, increasing their investments in metro network architecture in 2019 and 2020. As for international growth, we expect APEC, uh, including, including Japan, to resume their growth in FY20. As for EMEA, it's likely that there will be further growth uh, as the recent wins for the service providers translate into higher revenue growth. That's all for me, and uh, I pass on my time to Weiren for the technical analysis. Hi, thank you, Edmund. So I'll uh, move on to uh, Siena. So uh, for the Sienna Corp, uh, this is not Dow Jones, so sorry for a mistake. Uh, Sienna Corp, uh, the title just ignore it, but uh, however, this area just uh, just take note. Uh, we have a strong area of demand over here, as uh, highlighted over here. And for the strong demand, uh, actually it confluence with the lower amount of the Bollinger Band and the 78.6 of the Fibonacci retracement of uh, 30, uh, swing high of 32.76 to 46.86. So uh, we believe that uh, there might be a that is a best it, uh, price of entry. Uh, series of higher high and high low uh, mark the high uh, uptrend and the still and also the uptrend line is still intact. Uh, also uh, for the downward uh, correction, uh, we can still wait for the oversold closer for uh, for a better confirmation to enter the price. So I move on to Dow Jones. Uh, for Dow Jones, uh, we uh, for Dow Jones on the 23rd of September sharing, we share that Dow Jones may uh, ha actually has a, a possibility of a bearish fall, and indeed uh, last uh, so last week uh, it um, Dow Jones has it fall 1,000 points within two days. But however, on Friday and Thursday and Friday it subsequently recovered. Uh, but do take note that uh, although it has a slight bullish recovery, uh, there's a hangman instead of hammer. So a bearish sentiment is still running high. Uh, however, if should it break 27,400, which is the resistance zone highlighted in this um, light red or pink zone, then we can see that the upside of 28,000. Uh, as of the last sharing, uh, 28,000 is still our, but that may be a false breakout of 28,000 and then subsequently you will have a bearish fall. Uh, the support one and support two area is actually the, the, wave, uh, the wave two rebound of the, part of the e-wave and so um, and, and that conclude that uh, we have a bearish fall possibility and look at the transportation there's a diamond pattern uh, forming on the uh, the big diamond pattern forming of wave each chart uh, the key divergence as mentioned on the last few sharing uh, the divergence has really played a part but however the the uh, and as of last week um, Dow, uh, the transportation actually break the 10,000 psychological mark, although it has briefly recovered since as of last Friday. So uh, for the industrial, uh, it played out perfectly. And I said, I mentioned support and support two are actually the the corrective wave two of the E uh, E downward wave. 
and surely rebound. Uh, we we are likely see an uh a further a further bearish reversal over at twenty six thousand eight hundred, and then all the way to uh below twenty thousand. Uh, that's a scenario that uh, we are looking in the long term, and for the and for the uh, for the transportation, uh, you can see that the key lower highs and the key high highs over here. The, we have I've in, clearly identified the key divergence level. So this is not the whole Dow theory is proving that the market is not extremely um, bullish. So for the industrial average on the on the daily time frame, uh, we actually have a smaller version, uh, smaller scale of expanding trigger expanding. Uh, Excuse me. Um, we have a smaller expanding triangle. So for this, uh, the gap resistance actually has been broken. So we are looking of a slight bullish up, uh, bullish corrective to twenty seven thousand over here, which is over here. And then after that, uh, we will go back to uh, twenty four thousand, which is clearly the the in the um, the support one and support two I mentioned on the weekly time frame. So um, we are seeing a little bit of upside and then followed by a great, uh, great downfall. So transportation, uh, for a transportation daily chart, we are actually, um, the, the, whole, the whole alley wave suggests that it's expanding the double tree corrective wave movement. And in the longer term, uh, it's still, it, there, there is a possibility of uh, downward movement to 85,000. Uh, but however, we need the three wave up to form wave X in order for the grade four. So however, uh, there's always an invalidation point. So should uh, price break, uh, break above 11,000, we show here, and then uh, there's a possibility that you goes up to uh, the impulse third wave movement instead. So uh, these are the September 2019 technical calls returns. Uh, prices, uh, some of the prices have hit our target price. However, those uh, in blacks are those with remaining um, uh, as of last closing price in on the last year of September. So a cumulative return we have is 20.57%. 20, 20 I uh, just hope that we will carry on on the month of October. So I'll update this on the, on the, uh, week, uh, on the monthly basis on how it goes. So I'll pass on to Paul for the uh, Philip Singapore Weekly. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, I'll just move on to our usual uh, Singapore Weekly. Uh, in terms of the macro for Singapore, uh, we saw that our the, the PMI's report, manufacturing PMI's were at three year lows. Uh, uh, and then in terms of industry data, uh, we also saw some weak uh, Changi Air Cargo. Uh, this is an important data metric, uh, especially if for 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 sets, because that has been pulling their the uh, sets uh, earnings due to the weak uh, uh, air cargo at, at Changi. Uh, the other in in. Interesting industry data point we got was there was a strong rebound in in, in private hospital admissions. Uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the U.S., uh, obviously the, the the slowdown in the U.S. is spreading. Uh, we saw the services PMI collapse to three year lows. Uh, payrolls are also also slower. Uh, no, the momentum is slower, and and despite the the high uh, the record low unemployment rate, uh, but. Interesting for us has been the in terms of the some of the global data points. Uh, we saw that there was actually a, a uptick in global PMIs. Uh, this is after nineteen months of uh, deceleration. I will show you some of these charts later. Uh, in terms of trade talks, um, I, I think the only thing it's hard to predict, obviously, but the only conclusion we can make is that if the U.S. administration is concerned about the slowing economy that's spreading, I think one possible scenario is that uh, they could repeal actually the. The December tariffs because this the this will hit hard the hardest hit uh, uh, for consumers because most of these are consumer goods like electronics shoes and so forth and in return maybe China could just buy more stuff this could be maybe some an approach to a short term resolution to the trade talks uh, in terms of the and the other main event is probably going to be our the MAS monetary policy statement. Uh, what we think is, as you know, they will move the way they, they the exchange works is that they will either move the the slope up, of you know, right rise increase the slope flattening or or downward sloping, recenter widen. We think that most likely they will probably do a zero appreciation and possibly widen the the band. Basically, what it's going to do is just to weaken the the, the currency as the as uh, the economy and inflation is going be uh, below their forecast. 
in terms of our tactical views, we still look at the sideways movement for the market. Of course, yield will be the main will remain the core, uh, and but we do not expect any recessionary conditions. Uh, the third point is probably for us, we, we see better value in some of these US listed REITs. Uh, one other thing to note is that uh, in the recent trade, uh, trade spread, what we've seen is that the ASEAN is actually a medium term beneficiary of all this. I will show you a chart later. Uh, these are some of the key events. Uh, the main one is obviously 10 October, you have the US China meeting. Uh, this is MES terminology, not later than 14 October. They will make the MES MPS statement. The big one is obviously going to be 30 October. With the way the the economic data is beginning, we're probably going to expect more rate cuts by the FOMC by end of this month. Uh, I'll just run quickly uh, with you uh, on some of the, the charts. Uh, the PMI that came out was the red line. So this has quite a good lead in terms of how the Singapore GDP will be trending. So we think that the third quarter GDP is going to be very weak, but probably will go sideways, sideways uh, for the fourth quarter, uh, Singapore's fourth quarter GDP. The, I guess for here, the most interesting is probably the blue line. You can see that there's actually an improvement in the PMIs, manufacturing PMIs, despite the developed countries like Euro and US trending down. But what's helping is actually the emerging markets. What we've seen is some of the data points out of uh, like, uh, emerging markets actually improving. The big, for here, just some industry data was the, the actually we were very, very surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised that there's a big spike in private hospital admissions. So this is going to be good for some of the private hospitals healthcare stocks uh, in Singapore. Uh, this is the, the, the blue line is the one that's that's plaguing or troubling our sets because the uh, freight traffic is actually hurting their, their earnings because there's a high operating leverage in, uh, in freight traffic. Uh, just quickly on the US charts, this, uh, this, this, you see many weakness in the manufacturing and then we see weakness in services. And then we also even see a slowdown in jobs. Uh, and what was surprising is that uh, the hourly earnings actually was, was weak, even though we have full employment in the US. Uh, the final part here will be, the interesting thing here is that um, you can see that off from the trade wall, uh, the, the, the deficit, this is the US trade deficit with China is actually tapering down. But what is, is, is growing very strongly has been the, the deficit with ASEAN. So actually, you can, in a way, you can read it as ASEAN is probably the medium term beneficiary of the trade wall. You can see that there's a surge in the trade deficit. Okay, this is final final chart. It's just our affiliate absolute ten. Uh, we were actually flat this month. Uh, year to date, we are we are perform. What hurt us was, was actually Sing Xiong. I think that's more like a macro news coming out that the supermarket sales are weak. We we are still positive on on Sing Xiong. I know these are just for illustration, good cost and monthly rebalancing. Okay, I'll be open for questions. And we have a question on what will the impact be on DBS third quarter results given the turmoil in Hong Kong and if they bought over Tao Hing Bank, right? So for Hong Kong right now, um, given how we've been to Hong Kong itself for OCBC's investor day and we asked them uh, quite a lot of questions on the Hong Kong protests, they do not seem to notice any outflow of uh, wealth yet right now. And the third quarter results, if even if there is impact, it's probably on the uh, expected credit loss side for Hong Kong. But do take note that um, for the Singapore bank's exposure in Hong Kong, it's really very small. Uh, the market share is very small in Hong Kong. And most of the customers that uh, obtain loans from the three Singapore banks in Hong Kong are very, very strong um, SOEs and also they are very strong blue chip companies. So. In terms of expected credit loss wise, uh, we do not expect too much impact in the third quarter results for DBS and for um, OCBC as well. And uh, yes, DBS do own uh, Tao Hing Bank, which is in Hong Kong. And for OCBC, they have Queen Hong Bank. Whereas for UOB, they do not have exposure in uh, Hong Kong as well. They do not have um, a bank in Hong Kong. For UOB, it's mainly in Southeast Asia. So if you were to compare in terms of exposure to trade war and trade tensions, uh, UOB is at least uh, ex exposed because most of their loans and um, assets are anchored out of Southeast Asia. I, okay, so we have some questions uh, regarding First Read. Um, first one is, is it a buy? Uh, so currently we don't have coverage for First Read, um, but we well, we do note that actually for the price to NDV is uh, quite low currently. Um, as for the other questions pertaining to first read, uh, how many percent of current gross rental income is contributed by the four expiring Indonesian hospitals? Okay, so for, for Silom Hospital Sleepo Village, uh, which is this the first one, it, 
it contributes uh, twelve point seven percent of FY eighteen revenue. Uh, for Kerbon Juruk, Kerbon Juruk, uh, it contributes uh, seven point two percent of revenue. Uh, for the cancer, for the cancer hospital, which is, which has a uh, December two thousand twenty five uh, expiry, contributes uh, more significantly, which is uh, eighteen point four percent. So the other one is actually uh, a hot, a hotel country club asset. Uh, it contributes only 3.4% of revenue. So um, we also have a follow-up question about what will happen upon expiry. So currently, uh, due to the income support uh, that that Lipo Karachi is actually providing for the operator Silom Hospitals, um, Lipo, is, Lipo is actually subsidizing about 80% uh, of the rent. And because these hospitals are actually profitable, uh, it's likely that that um, Lipo will step out of the negotiations, leaving first week to to negotiate directly with the hotel operators, which is Silom. So, due to the fact that there is actually uh, no no real market or um, established market rent in the Indonesian hospital uh, market, it's a bit hard to decide whether or not the rent that the that first week is currently receiving is considered fair. Um, so, uh, there's an eighty percent income gap currently between the rent that first week is receiving and the rent that Silom is paying. So what what could happen is um, possibly first week might expect to take a bit of a haircut on the on the rent. Uh, how much how much haircut or how um, it's a bit hard to say because they're still currently in negotiations. Another th another thing that could possibly happen is um, they could pop that first week could probably op open um, open the open it up to the market to get a tender and, and see if, if there are any other operators who want to, who are interested in taking the building. Uh, in, in, in that way, they can, they can sort of establish a, a more fair market rent. Hi, we have a question on what are the implications or takeaway of increased private hospital admissions. So for the private healthcare sector for the listed companies in Singapore, definitely this is directly related to their local inpatient volume. So if we see the statistics of private uh, hospital patient admissions increasing, this will um, sort of have a positive impact on the quarter's results in terms of patient volumes rise from Singapore. So all along, um, because of our decreasing medical tourism, we have been experiencing contraction in our local um, private hospital admissions. So it was public that was taking the lead. But in this case, in um, the past three months, it was private sector growth that has been taking, taking the lead. So this... Um, scenario could be due to either um, higher take-up rate of private insurance among Singaporeans or it's uh, increasing from a lower base last year. Thank you. So um, I, I think I have another question about uh, the contribution of the hospitals, the expiring hospitals for for the uh, the contribution to the revenue. So um, I just go through it. Um, for the August 2021 expiries, Sarang Hospital uh, contributes 0.4% of FY18 revenue. Um, Lipo Village contributes 12.7%. Uh, uh, Kabun Juru contributes 7.2%. Uh, Surabaya contributes 2.8%. Um, Imperial I had the Imperial Hotel and Country Club, um, that is uh, not, not a hospital asset, but it contributes 3.4%. Of revenue and the cancer center uh, contributes uh, sorry 18.4 percent another question regarding how much is the impact of the sponsor on first read uh, any percentage guide um, uh, the real the real exposure to the the sponsor is actually um, the rent the rent due uh, due to the due to first read um, from the master leases which we um, they account for 82 percent of the of the master leases the revenue from the master leases um, in terms of, yeah, so so any um, real real impact uh, because the, these assets are actually um, rented out to Silom Hospitals, which is the actual hospital operator. Um, looking at Silom's uh, fi financials, we actually realized that um, the rent to Ibida for for Silom is uh, in the thirty in the thirties, so it's about thirty percent. Um, this versus uh, this compares to the rent to EBITDA ratio of first read assets, which is uh, 56.4%. So uh, all, all in, right, Silom is actually um, more profitable or rather as a whole, 
um, the whole portfolio of Salom is doing um, relatively better than the assets that are held by First Week. So we feel that in terms of uh, financial stability, uh, Salom is still viable. Yeah, but we, but we cannot um, actually comment on how how much uh, the impact, if any, on on whether or not the leases will be renewed and at what at what rate and whether there will be a haircut cut. Like, but but we do expect that there will be some. Um, we have a question about Brit Talk um, about why the price seems to be dropping. So um, the reason behind this is uh, the, their earnings actually fell by fifty percent, and they made a, a relatively substantial acquisition. And so um, the market is a little bit wary about the transaction. Yeah, hi. Uh, we got a question. Uh, why did Shenzhen share price drop so significantly recently? Frankly, I'm also scratching my head why. Because the, there's actually no the only bad news out there. Uh, um, it's it's mainly it's some the uh, industry the slowdown in supermarket sales that's been released industry wide. But like we saw in the first two quarters results, uh, Singsong continues to gain market share. I think we're not threefold or four or fourfold of the, the their gr sales is growing about ten percent, but the industry is contracting about I think one to two percent. So they are growing, they are outgrowing the the industry sales by multiple fold and capturing market share. But I think uh, the the price had done well the prior month uh, in August, and probably there's some profit taking, and probably some some worries about. The slowdown in supermarket sales, but if you're taking share maybe three, five times or ten times, I don't think there's a big, uh, a major worry. For, uh, and we should we expect some good results coming up uh, in the third quarter. Thank you. Okay, uh, we got a question. Judging from the current eco performance, will the MAS tilt the policy band down slightly? E yeah, they could. That could be a more aggressive stance. Uh, ours is we, uh, you know, they will the move the slope either up, down, or flat. So for us, we think they will keep the slope flat, but just widen the bend. That means uh, leaving more room for it to 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 go uh, to weaken. Uh, the reason we say that is that they rarely uh, push the the bend down unless the economy is really really bad. Uh, not that saying it's not bad now, but. They, they they rarely move the the band the, I mean the slope downwards so we just move, we think that they will just keep the slope flat but just widen the band so that there's more scope for weakness that's what we think of course the most aggressive is like global financial crisis they recenter the band i.e they will just gap down the, the 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 whole currency but that's very extreme so that's why we still think that they will probably just keep the slope neutral that's what we think yeah thanks for the question uh, the other question is uh, what is the reason for break top profit falling. Uh, frankly, we don't really cover the stock. Um, all we saw, we, we is the, and they don't give any briefings. So all we saw was that the revenue was up, but their distribution expenses uh, was was surging ahead. Uh. But but sorry, we don't cover, so we can't really give you a clear answer. So we don't to uh, speculate. Uh, but the reason they're weak is because the, the, the share price is weak because of the poor results. Yeah, and also they make some quite a, uh, uh, expensive uh, 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 acquisition recently. Thanks. Hi, if there's no other questions, we will end the webinar here today. Thank you for joining.